Um, so that kind of leads into liability. I've already spoken about liability a little bit, but the liability convention establish a fault-based liability regime in respect of two space objects colliding with one another. An absolute liability, meaning that you don't have to prove fault for a space object that falls to Earth. So in other words, if you are the state that launched a yep. space object, the fact that it does damage when it comes back down to Earth makes you liable no matter what. It doesn't matter whether you're at fault in any way or, or anything. And the so, simple you know, fact is you were the state that launched it. Yeah, and th th that's an important point. You said launched, right? Yes. So what if you're in, you know, in the case of the swarm satellites that we talked about earlier, if you're India launching an American company satellites, so India would still be at fault for harm that it would if they came down and harm stuff. Yes, yes. So, so I use the uh, launched as shorthand. There's actually four ways. You launched, you procured the launch. Yep. It was launched from your territory, or it was launched from a facility that you control. So again, if we convolute the situation even more, because it does get convoluted. Yes. French Guiana is always my favorite example in this, right? Because yes. uh, there's a Aryan French port in French Guiana. So if a rocket launched from there, taken say a Russian satellite, which has happened, mm. then came down and caused harm, French Guiana, as well as the rocket provider, as well as Russia could all be responsible? That's, that's right, potentially liable to pay compensation. So typically what happens in that situation is there are cross waivers that yeah, are signed yeah, yeah. between governments. And, and, and uh, the French government and French Guiana probably would have signed something with Russia saying, if you want to launch your satellite on our rocket from our launch facility, then you have to indemnify us. You, you, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, there's, yeah. so even though these laws are outlaid, there's still a lot of inter-negotiation and signing for every launch. And I think this is an important thing that maybe we don't realize. I mean, there are so many countries and companies launching satellites now from lots of different places, there has to be a lot of this legwork as well for absolutely. this all to happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yes. So this is an interesting story. I don't know if you're aware of this We, we have story. not talked about this yet, so I was glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1979, a part of Skylab came down in Esperance in Western Australia. Um, the Shire of Esperance <laughs> issued a littering fine to, to NASA. That's like my favorite years. Australian space story, to be honest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and uh, that, that littering fine remained unpaid. NASA said, we're not going to pay for, for littering. Um, but a U.S radio station said, well, uh, we think it'd be a good thing to pay this littering fine, a sort of gesture of goodwill. So the, the DJ from the radio station got his listeners to donate yep. small amounts of money until they had 400 Australian dollars. And that littering fine has now been paid. By the radio station on behalf of NAS. Oh, yeah, I, 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 of I'd NASA. love this. So yes. I, I, it's an entertaining story. I guess one question I've always, you know, it's always interesting to me. Was Esperance in right for the international law of use to fine NASA for littering? Or is that just, uh, that was silly, they never should have done it, right? Yeah. If we take that Canadian example, satellite crash, they rightfully so mm. sued Russia, so to speak, USSR, mm. and they paid on it. Mm. So was NASA actually in the wrong there? Well, not necessarily. It wouldn't have been the Shire of Esperance. Yeah, okay, that, that, that's true. Okay, pursue, fair enough. Pursue the Australian the government should the Australian, have? The Australian government could have pursued uh, the US government. And, and that, then that would have been rightfully so? Yes, okay. yes. They would have to establish some damage. Yep. So even though it's an absolute liability regime, it doesn't mean that you just get money. You yeah, have to yeah exactly. You show that you suffered some damage. And in the, in the case of Canada, there was an actual cleanup bill Yes. Because it was a nuclear powered satellite that required time and money and all that sort of stuff. And Esperance, that didn't really exist, right? Well, no, in fact, Esperance probably benefited rather than. <laughs> There's a museum on it now, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right, so if the f Australian government had decided to pursue it, it would have been real, or so to speak, or at least legitimate, again, yes. had they defined the damages. But because Esperance decided themselves it was not liable? 
Well, that, well yes, yeah. so, and that, that's the argument that NASA would have uh, taken, and, and NASA would have also said, well, what damage have you yeah, seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they would have been quite practical in saying, look, because uh, I assume they would have been happy to pay, right. at least for relationships rather than that, but yes. there was no damage. I mean, let's yes. be serious here. There is nothing. Yes. I think there's still people finding parts of it in their paddocks in Western Australia because of how big of an area it covered. Right, yeah. right. Yes, yes. Moving on though, so um, this is just a, a video and, and a, you, you may have seen this sort of thing before where uh, an Iridium satellite that was um, near the end of its life uh, collided with a Russian satellite, Cosmos 2251, yep. caused a lot of space debris. Um, and the issue here was who was at fault because liability when two objects collide is, is fault-based liability. You have to establish who is at uh, fault. It's like a car accident. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, so difficult though, because on the one hand, the Russian satellite is defunct. It doesn't have means to maneuver. That's right. Um, the Iridium satellite was near the end of its life and the operators made a commercial decision when they were given statistics or probability of a conjunction yep. not to move the satellite. So they assessed a risk and said, doesn't meet our threshold for whatever that may be and didn't choose to maneuver. Right. Okay. Right. So given that that is the circumstance, you might say, well, Iridium's not really in a position to, to make a claim. of Because they could have gotten out of the way. They could have gotten yeah. out of the way. But the issue, and this is part of the reason I want to show this video, is it's not just Iridium yes. who suffered um, because it causes, it adds to the yeah. cloud of space debris generally. That is already rapidly growing and that right. we'll explore a little bit later. And so, yeah, so I guess then here's always my question then. If that causes damage, that debris cloud, does one of them become responsible? That's a good question and has yet to be tested in, in international law. Interesting. Because I guess you would have to prove where it came from. Would that's, that be part of it? That, that's right. Because you have to show that liability, because the control's there, but you have to show that liability and regulation and registration and all that sort of stuff. Right, right. And, and I believe that uh, the US military and other people involved in space domain awareness do track the yep. provenance of particular pieces of space debris. Yep but not necessarily every piece. Not every other piece. And I guess this would be the same that in that case of the anti-satellite tests, mm. right? You know, if one of that debris does crash from Russia or China or the US into something, would they be liable or not? That's right, yeah, yeah. So complicated questions about that sort of thing. 